Hi, welcome to part one of This Week in Tudor History with me, Claire Ridgway. Today, I will be talking about a playwright and clergyman who picked wonderful titles for his works. I'll be introducing you to Sir Rafe Sadler, who you might have come across in Hilary Mantel's Wolf Hall, because he was a man close to Thomas Cromwell. And then I'll leave you with a dying Tudor king making his will. On the 29th of March, 1591, in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, playwright and Church of England clergyman William Wager, or Wagger, was buried at the church where he was rector, St Bennet Grace Church. I was drawn to him simply because of the titles of two of his plays. I just love these titles. Enough is as good as a feast, is the first one. And the longer thou livest, the more fool thou art. Perfect. Those are being described as polemical Protestant interludes. I just love those titles. Here are a few facts about this Elizabethan playwright and churchman. William Wager was the son of playwright, former Franciscan friar and rector Lewis Wager and his wife Eleanor. And it's thought that William was born in around 1537-1538. Wager married Ellen Godson in 1562 at his father's church, St James Garlickhithe in London. And they had four children together, including two sons, Edward and Thomas. In 1567, Wager became rector of St. Bennet Grace Church and he was licensed to preach throughout London. He was known for what was described as his hot words and his attacks on Catholicism. Wager's biographer, Peter Happe, describes Enough is as good as a feast as a play that shows the tragic but sinful downfall of worldly man an extortioner who dies refusing grace. Wager's other works include The Longer Thou Livest, The More Fool Thou Art, The Cruel Debtor, and Tis Good Sleeping in a Whole Skin. I like that one. I wonder what it's like sleeping in half a skin. In 1573, Wager was appointed as governor of Elizabeth I's new grammar school in Barnet. And in 1593, he appears in the records as hearing petitions from prisoners at three of London's prisons. By the way, the whole title of Enough is as Good as a Feast is a comedy or interlude entitled Enough is as Good as a Feast, very fruitful, godly and full of pleasant mirth. And the whole title of The Longer Thou Livest, The More Fool Thou Art is A very merry and pithy comedy called The Longer Thou Livest, The More Fool Thou Art. A mirror very necessary for youth and especially for such as are like to come to dignities and promotion, as it may well appear in the matter following. Great title. I find Tudor titles so very funny. I found some read-through and discussion videos on William Wager's plays on YouTube, so I'll share those with you. Moving on to the 30th of March. On the 30th of March, 1587, also in the reign of Elizabeth I, Sir Rafe Sadler died. He was in his 80th year. Sadler was a diplomat and administrator who worked as Cromwell's secretary before being noticed by King Henry VIII. At his death, he was one of the richest men in England. Here are a few more facts about him. Rafe Sadler was born in 1507 and he was the eldest son of administrator Henry Sadler of Warwickshire and Hackney. Henry Sadler worked as a steward to Sir Edward Belknap until 1521. Belknap was one of Henry VIII's privy councillors. He then served Thomas Gray, second Marquis of Dorset. By 1521, when Rafe was about 14, he'd entered the service of Thomas Cromwell who ensured that he was taught Latin, Greek, French and law. In 1526, when he was about 19, Sadler became Cromwell's secretary, drafting and writing Cromwell's letters and helping with the administration of his household. By 1529, after eight years of service to Cromwell, he was close enough to Cromwell to be named as an executor in Cromwell's will. 
By 1535, Sadler had married Ellen Mitchell, daughter of John Mitchell of Much Haddam. He met her when she was working as a laundress in Cromwell's household. They had seven surviving children together, four daughters and three sons. Thomas, who must surely have been named after Cromwell, and then Henry and Edward, presumably named after the King and Prince Edward. In 1545, Sadler found out that his marriage was actually bigamous, because Ellen's first husband, Matthew Barr, a known drunkard who'd abandoned her and who'd been presumed dead, was actually still alive and had returned from Ireland. This meant that Sadler's marriage was invalid and his children illegitimate. Thomas Risley, Lord Chancellor, wrote that Master Sadler took his matter very heavily. In 1546, a private act of Parliament made Sadler and Ellen's marriage valid. Sadler came to King Henry VIII's attention after he helped examine Sir Thomas More and John Fisher, Bishop of Rochester. He was made Clerk of the Hanapa of Chancery in 1535, and then in 1536, a gentleman of the King's Privy Chamber. In 1536, Sadler also served as a Member of Parliament for Hindon in Wiltshire. In 1537, Sadler was sent on a diplomatic mission to Scotland, both to improve relations between England and Scotland and regarding complaints Henry VIII's sister, Margaret Tudor, Dowager Queen of Scotland, had made about her third husband, Lord Mevan. While travelling through the north of England, he also arrested members of the Percy household who'd been involved in the recent pilgrimage of Grace Rebellion. In 1537, Sadler also joined the King's Privy Council. In 1539, Sadler was elected as a Knight of the Shire for Middlesex, and in April 1540, he was knighted and made the King's principal secretary, along with Thomas Risley. In 1540, he also carried out another diplomatic mission to Scotland. His mission this time was to discredit Cardinal David Beaton, Archbishop of St Andrews. He also took a gift of six geldings from King Henry VIII to James V, but the Scottish king was far from impressed with the horses. Sadler put forward the idea of a personal meeting between James and his uncle Henry VIII, and when he left Scotland in March 1541, he believed that this meeting was arranged. However, when the English king travelled to York on his progress to the north with his fifth wife Catherine Howard, the Scottish king stood him up. While Sadler had been away in Scotland, his former patron and friend Thomas Cromwell had been brought down by his enemies and he'd been executed on the same day that the king married Catherine Howard. In January 1541, Sadler, Sir Thomas Wyatt and Sir John Bullock were arrested and imprisoned in the Tower of London. However, Sadler was released after just a few days and he was able to carry on in the King's service, although he was not chosen to accompany the King on the progress to the North that summer. His biographer, Gervais Phillips, writes of how Sadler didn't just date his letters, he also wrote the hour on them, and this gives us an insight into his working life, showing that he was up by 4am and often up after midnight, an industrious man. In late 1541, Sadler was active in gathering evidence against Catherine Howard, and he also tried unsuccessfully to discredit the Duke of Norfolk and Bishop Gardiner, both of whom had helped bring down Thomas Cromwell the previous year. In 1543, Sadler was sent to Scotland as the resident English ambassador there, following the death of King James V and the accession of the infant Mary, Queen of Scots. William Paget replaced him as the King's secretary during his absence. From 1543 to 1553, he served King Henry VIII and then Edward VI as master of the Great Wardrobe, and he was Henry VIII's go-to financial advisor. In 1544, he purchased the manor of Standon in Hertfordshire and built a mansion there. By Henry VIII's death in 1547, Sadler owned properties across 25 English and Welsh counties, 
and his annual income was £372, 13 shillings and four pence, which is around £157,000 in today's money. Sadler was in charge of organising Henry VIII's funeral in 1547 and he'd been appointed as an assistant to the 16 executors chosen by the late king to form a regency council to help the young King Edward VI govern the country. The king also left him £200 in his will. Sadler, though, supported Edward Seymour becoming Lord Protector and was appointed to the Privy Council. He was made High Treasurer of the Army and sent to Scotland in September 1547 and he fought at the Battle of Pinkey, being created a Knight Banneret for his service. Sadler was one of those who signed the execution warrant of the Lord Protector's brother, Thomas Seymour, in 1549. And in that same year, he served against the rebels of Ketz Rebellion. He also supported John Dudley in his coup against the Lord Protector. And in 1553, he signed the letters patent regarding Edward VI's wish for Lady Jane Grey to be his successor. And during Queen Jane's short reign, he worked for her in Hertfordshire. Due to his support of the Duke of Northumberland and Queen Jane, he lost his place on the Privy Council when Mary I took the throne. He also lost the office of Master of the Great Wardrobe and was put under house arrest for a few days, although he was later pardoned. Sensibly, Sadler chose to retire to his estate at Standham while Mary was on the throne. But then in November 1558, he was appointed to the Privy Council of the new Queen Elizabeth I and he served as an MP for Hertfordshire on numerous occasions. In 1559, he was sent on a mission to Scotland again, and he was also made Warden of the East and Middle Marches, sending reports on what was going on in Scotland to William Cecil Baron Burley. In 1560, he helped arrange the Treaty of Edinburgh between England and Scotland. During Elizabeth's reign, he was against the idea of Mary, Queen of Scots, being the Queen's successor, and he was also against Elizabeth making a French marriage match. In 1568, he was appointed Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, an office he held until his death. In that same year, he was sent to York to meet with a Scottish delegation following Mary, Queen of Scots's escape to England, and he and his fellow commissioners were informed of the casket letters. He was involved in the case against Mary, Queen of Scots, from beginning to end. In 1569, he helped put down the rising of the Northern Earls and he arrested Thomas Howard, 4th Duke of Norfolk, after the discovery of the Ridolfi plot. In 1584, Sadler acted as jailer to Mary, Queen of Scots at Wingfield and then in 1585 at Tutbury where he allowed Mary to accompany him hawking, which earned him a rebuke from Sir Francis Walsingham. He was, however, in full support of Mary being executed. Sadler died on the 30th of March, 1587, leaving most of his lands and properties to his eldest son, Thomas, also leaving some to his son, Henry, and a diamond ring to his daughter, Jane. An illegitimate son, Richard, received an annuity. He was laid to rest in St Mary's Church, Standon. Some of Sadler's letters and speeches have been compiled and published in two volumes along with The Life of Sir Rafe Sadler by Walter Scott. I'll give you links to read them. His speeches regarding Mary Queen of Scots and Elizabeth I and the French marriage match do make interesting reading. And that was really a potted history of Sir Rafe Sadler. You could definitely write a book on the man. And finally, the 31st of March, and I'm taking you back to the final days of King Henry VII's reign. On the 31st of March, 1509, the dying King Henry VII made his last will and testament at Richmond Palace, three weeks before his death. It was based on an earlier draft with some new provisions added. For example, the addition of Sir Richard Empson and Edmund Dudley to the list of executors. 
Just three days after Henry VII's death and the accession of King Henry VIII, those two executors were arrested and imprisoned in the Tower of London, accused of plotting to hold, guide and govern the king and his council by assembling men to undertake a coup d'etat. There is no evidence that they were plotting. They were simply scapegoats for the late king's unpopular financial measures, a way of the young King Henry VIII showing that his reign would be different. Well, that's all for now. But coming up in part two, I'll be talking about a poet and soldier who kept being imprisoned, a man who joined the Order of St John as early as he possibly could, but survived its dissolution and ended his days serving Queen Elizabeth I. And then I'll mention the death of a mother and grandmother of queens before moving on to the knighting of a famous explorer. So do join me then. You can subscribe to the channel by clicking round about there. You can hit the bell to be notified as my videos go live. You can give me a like and leave me a comment and I'll see you very soon. Take care. Bye bye. <laughs>